Hey everyone, welcome to Advanced Exercise Physiology. This is Chapter 13, The Physiology of Training and the Effects on VO2 Max, Performance, Homeostasis, and Strength. The objectives of this chapter are to 1. Explain the basic principles of training, including overload, reversibility, and specificity. 2. To discuss the role that genetics play in determining VO2 Max. 3. Indicate the typical change in VO2 Max with endurance training programs and the effect of the initial pre-training value on the magnitude of the increase. Four, to state the typical VO2 max values for various sedentary, active, and athletic populations. Five, to understand the contribution of heart rate, stroke volume, and the arterial venal O2 difference in determining the VO2 max. Six, to discuss how training increases VO2 max. Seven, to define preload, afterload, and contractility, and discuss the role of each and in increasing in the maximal stroke volume that occurs with endurance training. Eight, to describe the changes in muscle structure that are responsible for the increase in the maximal atrial venal O2 difference with endurance training. Nine, list and discuss the primary changes that occur in skeletal muscle as a result of endurance training. Ten, Explain how endurance training improves the acid-base balance during exercise. 11. To outline the quote-unquote big picture changes that occur in skeletal muscle as a result of exercise training and discuss the specificity of exercise training responses. 12. List the four primary signal transduction pathways in skeletal muscle. 13. List and define the function of six important secondary messengers in skeletal muscle. 14. Outline the signaling events that lead to endurance training induced muscle adaptation. 15. Discuss how changes in the quote unquote the central command and the peripheral feedback following the endurance training program can lower the heart rate, ventilation, and catecholamine response to a submaximal exercise bout. 16. Describe the underlying causes of the decrease in VO2 max that occur with a cessation of endurance training. 17. Contrast the role of neural adaptation with hypertrophy in the increase in strength that occur with resistance training. 18. Identify the primary changes that occur in skeletal muscle fibers in response to resistance training. 19. Outline the signaling events that lead to resistance training induced increases in muscle growth. 20. Discuss how detraining following strength training impacts muscle fiber size and strength and explain how retraining impacts muscle fiber size and strength. 21. Explain why concurrent strength and endurance training can impair strength gains. If you're taking notes, here's an outline to follow covering the major topics of the lecture, including principles of training, endurance training and VO2 max, answering the question, why does exercise training improve VO2 max, looking at endurance training and the effects on performance and homeostasis, looking at the molecular basis of exercise training adaptation, and signal events leading to endurance training induced muscle adaptation. There's also endurance training links between muscle and system physiology, detraining following endurance training, physiological effects of strength training, the mechanisms responsible for resistance training induced increases in strength, signaling events in leading to endurance training induced muscle growth, D-training following strength training, and concurrent strength and endurance training. To begin with, we will look at the principles of training. The first is which is overload. This is the training effect that occurs when a system is exercised at a level beyond which it is normally accustomed. Specificity is a training effect is specific to the muscle fibers involved, the energy systems involved, either aerobic or anaerobic, the velocity of contraction, and the types of contraction, both eccentric, concentric, and isometric. There's also the principle of reversibility, where gains are lost when overload is removed. In summary, the principle of overload states that for a training effect to occur, a system or tissue must be challenged with an intensity, duration, or frequency of exercise, which is not accustomed. Over time, the tissue or system adapts to this load. Reversibility is the principle, is the corollary to the overload principle. Also, the principle of specificity indicates that the training effect is limited to the muscle fibers involved in the activity. In addition, 
The muscle fiber adapts specifically to the type of activity, mitochondrial and capillary adaptation to the endurance training, and contractile protein adaptations to res resistive weight training. Now looking more specifically at endurance training and VO2 max, we see that endurance training increases VO2 max. This is done with large muscle groups and dynamic activities and is accomplished with 20 to 60 minute exercise sessions three to five times per week at an intensity of 50 to 85 percent of the VO2 max. Effective increases in VO2 max on average are 15 to 20 percent. However, it's only 2 to 3 percent in individuals with a high initial VO2 max, and it also requires an intensity of greater than 70 percent of the VO2 max. Also, up to 50 percent in those with a low initial VO2 max volume, and the training intensity only needs to be 40 to 50 percent of the VO2 max. Also, VO2 max is based on a genetic predisposition, which accounts for about 50 percent of the VO2 max and is a prerequisite for a very high VO2 max. Table 13.1 reflects the range of VO2 max values in the population. Now if we look at the Heritage Family Study, it was designed to study the role of genotype in cardiovascular, metabolic, and our hormonal responses to exercise and training. Some of the results included the heritability of the VO2 max is approximately 50% that there's a large variation and change in VO2 max with training, but the average improvement is 15 to 20 percent, in which range from no improvement to a 50 percent increase, and the heritability of change in VO2 max is approximately 47 percent. Also, 21 genes play a role in the change of the VO2 max with training. In summary, endurance training programs that increase VO2 max involve large muscle mass in dynamic activity for 20 to 60 minutes per session, three to five times per week, at an intensity of 50 to 85 percent of the VO2 max. Although the VO2 max increases an average about 15 to 20 percent as a result of an endurance training program, the largest increases are associated with deconditioned or patient populations having a very low pre-training VO2 max values. Also, genetic predisposition accounts for approximately 50% of one's VO2 max value. Very strenuous and or prolonged training can increase the VO2 max in normal sedentary individuals up to 50%. Now looking at calculations of VO2 max, we see that it is the product of the maximal cardiac output and the atrial venous difference. The difference in VO2 max is different in populations, and this is primarily due to differences in the stroke volume max. Improvement in VO2 max can be seen at approximately 50% with an increased stroke volume and approximately 50% in the atrial venous difference. Also, looking at shorter durations in training, approximately four months, we see that the increase in stroke volume is greater than the increase in the atrial venous difference. However, when we look at longer duration training of approximately 28 months, we see that the difference in the atrial venous increase is greater than the increase in stroke volume. Table 13.2 shows the duration of training and the changes in VO2 max. Please reference your book for this table. Now looking more closely at stroke volume, we see an increased maximal stroke volume with training where we have an increased preload, or an EDV, which leads to increased plasma volume, increased venous return, and increased ventricular volume. Also, there's a decreased afterload, or total peripheral resistance, which is due to a decreased arterial constriction and an increased maximal muscle blood flow with no change in the mean arterial pressure, as well as an increased contractility. These changes occur rapidly with 11% increase in plasma volume, 7% increase in the VO2 max, and 10% increase in the stroke volume within six days of training. The factors listed in this diagram again represent the increase in stroke volume as a result of training. Now if we look at the atrial venous diff O2 difference, we see that it is due to an increase in muscle blood flow and a decrease in the sympathetic nervous system vasoconstriction. Also, it's an improved ability of the muscles to actually extract the oxygen from the blood, which is due to increased capillary density, 
which slows blood flow through the muscles and increase mitochondrial number. The diagram below reflects the factors causing an increased VO2 max, which can also be attributed to the maximal cardiac output increase from stroke volume or the increase in the atrial venous O2 difference. In summary, in young sedentary subjects, approximately 50% of the increase in the VO2 max is due to training is related to an increase in maximal stroke volume and 50% is due to an increase in the atrial venous O2 difference. Also, training induced increase in the maximal stroke volume is due to both an increase in preload and a decrease in the afterload. The increased preload is primarily due to an increase in the end diastolic ventricular volume and the associated increase in plasma volume. Also, the decreased afterload is due to the decrease in the areolar constriction in trained muscles, increasing the maximal muscle blood flow with no change in the mean arterial pressure. Also, in young sedentary subjects, 50% of the increase in the VO2 max is due to the increase in the system systemic atrial venous O2 difference. The increased Atrial venous O2 difference is due to an increase in the capillary density of the trained muscles that is needed to accept the increase in maximal muscle blood flow. The greater capillary density allows for sufficient, slow red blood cell transit time through the muscle, providing enough time for oxygen diffusion, which is facilitated by an increased number of mitochondrial effects of endurance training on maintenance of homeostasis. We see a more rapid transition from rest to steady state a reduced reliance on glycogen stores, cardiovascular and thermoregulatory adaptations. We also see this due to neural and hormonal adaptations and also due to the structural and biomechanical or biochemical changes in the muscle. Now, as we focus on endurance training and how it induces changes in fiber type and capillarity, we see that fast to slow shift in muscle fiber type where there's a reduction in fast myosin, an increase in slow myosin, and the extent of change is determined by the duration of the training and genetics. Also, we see an increased number of capillaries where we have enhanced diffusion of oxygen and increased removal of waste. In addition, when we look at endurance training and how it increases mitochondrial content and skeletal muscle fibers, if we look at the mitochondria in the muscles, we see that there's a subsclerolemma, which are located below the sclerolemma, and there's intramyofibular, which are located around the contractile proteins. What we also see is that the mitochondrial content increases quickly, but this depends on the intensity and the duration of the training, and it can increase 50 to 100% within the first six weeks. These results are increased during endurance performance due to changes in muscle metabolism. Again, looking at mitochondrial number, but how it relates to performance, we see that ADP stimulates mitochondrial ATP production. There's also an increased mitochondrial number following training, which at lower ADP is needed to increase ADP production and VO2. Also, if the oxygen jet is lower following training, we see the same VO2 at lower ADP concentrations. In addition, energy requirements can be met by oxidative ATP production at the onset of exercise, which leads to a faster rise in the VO2 curve and steady state, in, a steady state is reached earlier. This results in less lactate and hydrogen ion formation, as well as less creatine phosphate depletion. Here is a diagram of the mitochondrial number and ADP concentration needed to increase VO2. Here's another graph looking at endurance training and how it reduces the O2 deficit. Now if we look at the role of exercise intensity and duration on mitochondrial adaptations, we first see that looking at citrate synthase, which is a marker of mitochondrial oxidative capacity. When we see the effects of exercise training, we look at 55%, 65%, or 75% of VO2 max, and we see an increased CS in oxidative type 2A fibers with all training intensities. Now, if we look at the effects of exercise duration at 30, 60, or 90 minutes, we see there's no difference between the durations on CS activity 
in type 2a fibers. We do see a C increase in CS activity in type 2x fibers with high intensity, longer duration training, however. Here is a graph showing the changes in citrate synthase activity with exercise. Now if we look at the biochemical adaptations and plasma glucose concentrations, we see an increased fat utilization and sparing of plasma glucose and muscle glycogen. There's a transport of free fatty acids into the muscle with increased capillary density and increased fatty acid binding protein and fatty acid translocase. From there, we look at the transport of free fatty acids from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria, where we see an increased mitochondrial number and higher levels of CTP1 and FAT. Also, when we look at the mitochondrial oxidation of free fatty acids, we see an increased enzyme of beta oxidation. We also see an increased rate of acetyl-CoA formation and high citrate levels, which inhibits PFK and glycolysis. Here is a diagram showing the effects of the mitochondrial and capillaries on free fatty acid and glucose utilization. In summary, endurance training improves the ability of muscle fibers to maintain homeostasis during prolonged exercise. Regular bouts of endurance training results in a fast to slow shift in muscle fiber types and also increases the number of capillaries surrounding the trained muscle fibers. Endurance exercise also increases the number of both subsclerolemma and intramyelofibular mitochondria in exercise muscles. Also, the combination of the increase in the density of capillaries and the number of mitochondria per muscle fiber increases the capacity to transport free fatty acids from the plasma to the cytoplasm to the mitochondria. The increase in the enzymes of the fatty acid cycle increase the rate of the formation of acetyl-CoA from free fatty acids for oxidation in the Krebs cycle. This increase in fat oxidation in endurance trained athletes spares both muscle glycogen and plasma glucose. These three points are summarized in figure 13.6. Next, looking at how endurance training improves muscle antioxidant capacity, we see that free radicals are produced by contracting muscles and that these free radicals can damage muscle contractile protein. However, training increases endogenous antioxidants, which protects against oxidative damage and fatigue from the free radicals. Now, if we also take a look at how exercise training improves the acid-base balance during exercise, we can look at first the lactate production during exercise. But what we see during training adaptations are an increased mitochondrial number, where less carbohydrate utilization happens, as a result less pyruvate is formed, we also see increased NADH shuttles where less NADH is available for lactic acid formation and we also see a change in the LDH type which will lead to heart formed H4 which has a lower affinity for pyruvate which would equal less lactic acid formation. The diagram below shows that increased mitochondrial, increased mitochondrial number and the blood pH. In summary, endurance training increases endogenous antioxidants in trained muscles and these changes protect muscle fibers against free radical mediated damage and fatigue during prolonged exercise endurance. High intensity interval exercise training can increase the buffering capacity of the exercise muscles as well. Finally, endurance training does not increase muscle buffering capacity, but regular endurance training results in less disruption of blood pH during submaximal work because endurance trained muscles produce less lactic acid or la less lactate and hydrogen ion. Now, if we look at training adaptations in the big picture, we see that endurance and resistance exercise increase specific muscle proteins. So the exercise stress activates transcription. The process of training induced muscle adaptation looks at muscle contraction which activates the primary and secondary messengers and results in the expression of genes and synthesis of proteins. This peaks around 4 to 8 hours and is back to baseline levels after 24 hours. This is why daily exercise is needed. Here are two graphs showing the mRNA and protein changes in response to exercise. Now looking at the primary signal transduction pathways in skeletal muscle, we see that there are primary signals for muscle adaptation. These include mechanical stretch, calcium, 
via calmodulin dependent kinase, free radicals, and phosphate muscle energy levels such as the AMP ATP ratio, which activates AMP kinase. We also see primary signals that lead to adaptation, which is an increase in protein synthesis. Also, when looking at the, the effects depend on exercise stimulus, this would relate to intensity and duration, as well as resistance versus endurance training. Now, looking at the secondary messengers in skeletal muscle, we see that there's AMPK, which was involved in glucose uptake, fatty acid oxidation, and mitochondrial biogenesis. We have PGC1-alpha, which increases in capillaries, mitochondria, and antioxidant en enzymes, as well as it's activated by P38 and calcium MK. We also have calcineurin, which is involved in fiber growth, fast to slow fiber type changes. We also have IGF-1, AKT, and MTOR, which are involved in muscle growth from resistance training. And finally, we have NFKB, which is involved in antioxidant enzymes. In summary, independent of the type of exercise stimulus, i.e. endurance or resistance exercise, the training-induced adaptation that occurs in muscle fibers is the result of the increase in the amount of a specific protein. The exercise-induced adaptations in skeletal muscle fibers are specific to the type of exercise stimulus, however. Also, exercise-induced muscle adaptations occur due to the coordination between the primary and the secondary signaling pathways in muscle fiber types. Also, the four primary signals for exercise-induced muscle adaptation include muscle stretch, increases in free cellular calcium, elevated free radicals, and decreases in muscle phosphate energy levels. These primary signals then activate downstream secondary signaling pathways to promote gene expression. There are five secondary signaling molecules that contribute to exercise-induced muscle adaptation. These signaling molecules are activated via one of the four primary signaling pathways and act directly or indirectly to increase gene expression of a specific muscle protein. Now if we look at, again at exercise-induced signaling events, if we first see primary signals, which would be an increase in calcium, an increase in the AMP to ATP ratio, or an increase in free radicals. This would lead to an increase in the secondary signals. The responses would be a fast to slow fiber type shift, mitochondrial biogenesis, or antioxidant enzyme synthesis. Here is a diagram showing the variety of different exercise induced signals. In summary, the three primary signals involved in endurance exercise induced muscle adaptation are increases in cellular free calcium, elevated free radicals, and decreases in muscle phosphate energy levels. These primary signals then activate one or more of the downstream secondary signal pathways to promote gene expression. There are six secondary signal molecules that contribute to endurance exercise induced muscle adaptation. Also, there's both active Calcernin and PCG1-alpha, which play important roles in endurance exercise induced fast to slow fiber transformations. Collectively, all of these secondary signals participate in activation of PGC1-alpha. An active PGC1-alpha is the master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. In also, both active PCG1-alpha and NFKB contribute to the exercise-induced increase in muscle antioxidants. Now, if we look at the links between muscle and systemic physiology, we see a biochemical adaptations to training influence the physiological responses to exercise, with, in particular, the sympathetic nervous system with a decrease in epinephrine and norepinephrine, or the cardiovascular system with a decrease in heart rate and ventilation. This is due to reduction in the feedback from the muscle chemoreceptors and a reduced number of motor units recruited. This is demonstrated in one-leg training studies where there's a lack of transfer of training effect to the untrained leg. Here is a diagram with graphs representing the lack of transfer of training effect. Now looking at the peripheral and central control of cardiorespiratory responses, we look at first the peripheral feedback from working muscles. This occurs in group 3 and group 4 nerve fibers, 
which are responsive to tension, temperature, and chemical changes, and feed into the cardiovascular control center. Regarding the central command, we see that this is the motor cortex, cerebellum, and basal ganglia, and these are involved in the recruitment of muscle fibers and stimulates the cardiorespiratory control center. Here is a diagram showing the peripheral control of heart rate, ventilation, and blood flow. In addition, here is how the control center controls the cardiorespiratory responses. In summary, the biomechanical changes in muscle due to endurance training influence the physiological responses to exercise. The reduction in the feedback from chemoreceptors in the trained muscle and the decreased need to recruit motor units to accomplish an exercise task results in a reduced sympathetic nervous system, heart rate, and ventilation responses in submaximal exercise. Now if we focus on detraining and its effects on VO2 max, we see a rapid decrease in the VO2 max in response to detraining, with a decrease of approximately 8% within 12 days and 20% after 84 days. We also see in a decrease in the amount of stroke volume, which is a rapid, due to a rapid loss of plasma volume. There's also a decreased maximal atrial venous O2 difference due to a decrease in mitochondria, a decrease in oxidative capacity of muscle, which is due to the decrease in type 2A fibers, and an increase in type 2X fibers. There's also an initial decrease within 12 days due to a decrease in stroke volume, and a later decrease due to the decrease in the atrial venous O2 max. The following graph shows the detraining and the changes in VO2 max and cardiovascular variables. Now when we look at retraining the VO2 max, we see that muscle mitochondria adapt quickly to training and double within the first five weeks of training. We also see mitochondrial adaptations lost quickly with detraining, whereas loss of 50% of training gain within one week of detraining, and the majority of adaptation is lost within the two weeks. This requires three to four weeks of retraining to regain the mitochondrial adaptations. Here is a graph showing the time course for training and detraining of mitochondrial changes. In summary, after stoppage of exercise training, VO2 max begins to decline quickly and can decrease by 8% within 12 days after cessation of training and decline by almost 20% following 84 days of detraining. The decrease in VO2 max with sensation of training is due to both a decrease in maximal stroke volume and a decrease in oxygen extraction, and the reverse of what happens with training. Exercise performance during submaxillal exercise tasks also declines rapidly during the following detraining, due to primarily due to a decline in the number of mitochondria in the muscle fibers. Now when we focus on the physiological effects of strength training, we first see muscular strength, which is the maximal force a muscle or muscle groups can generate for a one repetition maximum. There also is muscular endurance, which is the ability to make repeated contractions against a submaximal load. Now if we focus on the strength training, there's a percent gain which is inversely proportional to the initial strength. There are some genetic limitations to gains in strength, however. Some people take uh, high resistance training, which is 2 to 10 reps um, to gain strength, but there's also lower resistance training, greater than 20 reps, to gain endurance. Now if we look at aging strength and training, we see there's a decline in strength after the age of 50. This is due to the loss of muscle mass, and we also see a loss of both type 1 and type 2 fibers, atrophy of the type 2 fibers, and a loss of intramuscular fat and connective tissue. There's also a loss of motor units, a reorganization of the motor units, which is also associated with NSAID use. What we can see is though, if we use progressive resistance training, the causes of muscle hypertrophy and strength gains are seen, and it is important for activities of daily living, balance, and a reduced risk of falls. Now, the focusing on resistance training induced changes in the nervous system, we see that neural adaptation are responsible for early gains in strength, especially during the initial 8 to 20 weeks. Adaptations include an increased ability to recruit motor units, altered motor neuron firing rates, enhanced motor unit synchronization, and the removal of neural inhibition. This is a diagram that focuses on the neural and muscular adaptations to resistance training.
Now, if we look at the resistance training induced changes in the skeletal muscle size, we see hyperplasia, which is an increased muscle fiber number, and a mixed evidence in human studies. 90 to 95% of muscle enlargement is due to hypertrophy. So hypertrophy is the enlargement of both type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers with a greater degree of hypertrophy in type 2 muscle fibers. We also see an increase in myofibular proteins, increases number of cross bridges, and increased ability to generate force. We also see a fast to slow shift in fiber type where we see a, a go from type 2X to type 2A. 5 to 11% of the change following 20 weeks of training to a lesser extent than endurance training where there is also an increase of type 1 fibers. So if we ask the question, can resistance training improve muscle oxidative capacity and increase capillary number? We see conflicting results from studies. Some show a decrease or no change in mitochondrial content. Others small, show a small increase. Some show small increases in capillary number, while others show small decreases. The reason for the conflicting results are different frequency and duration of training, as well as long-term high-volume training can improve the oxidative capacity of muscles. Now, if we look at if resistance training improves muscle antioxidant enzyme activity, we see that resistance training improves the capacity at 100% of the increase in two antioxidant enzymes. However, there's limited evidence and long-term benefits are unclear. In summary, Increases in strength due to short term, which would be 8 to 20 weeks of resistance training, are largely due to the result of the changes in the nervous system, whereas gains in strength during long term training programs are due to an increase in the size of the muscle. Current evidence suggests that hyperplasia may occur in humans. Nonetheless, most, approximately 90 to 95 percent of the increase in muscle size following resistance training occurs due to an increase in the muscle hypertrophy and not hyperplasia. Prolonged periods of resistance training can promote a fast to slow shift in muscle fiber types. Most of this training induced fiber shift is the conversion of type 2X to type 2A fibers with no increase in the number of type 1 fibers. Whether resistance training improves, muscle oxidative properties remains controversial. However, it is possible that long term and high volume resistance training programs can improve muscle oxidative capacities and increase capillary numbers around the trained muscle fibers. Also, resistance training improves the antioxidant capacity of the trained muscle. Now, if we look at resistance training and induced signaling events, we see that the primary signal is an increase in muscle stretch, which leads to secondary signals, which are increases in IGF-1, AKT, and MTOR. These will in induce protein synthesis, and a single bout can increase protein synthesis by 50 to 100%. The responses to this would then be muscle hypertrophy, which is increased cross-sectional area of fibers, and an increased number of myonuclei in each fiber, which would arise from satellite cells and is required for continued muscle adaptations. Here is a diagram showing the resistance training induced signaling events. And here is a diagram showing how resistance training induced hypertrophy in myonuclei look. In summary, Resistance training increases the synthesis of contractile proteins in muscle, and this results in an increase in the cross-sectional area of fibers. Also, resistance training induced increases the protein synthesis that occurs via an increase in translation, which is controlled by IGF-1, AKT, and MTOR signaling pathways. The resistance training results in parallel increases in muscle fiber cross-sectional area and an increased number of myonuclei. Also, satellite cells are the source of additional nuclei and muscle fibers, and the supplemental supplement of myonuclei to muscle fibers is required to achieve maximal fiber hypertrophy in response to resistance training. Now, if we look at detraining and strength and muscle size, we see a slow decrease in strength. Approximately 31% of the decrease in strength follows 30 weeks of detraining. It's associated with small changes in fiber size, where type 1 fiber size is approximately 2%, type 2A fiber size at 10%, and type 2X fiber size at 14%. This is again due primarily to the nervous system changes as well. Retraining results in rapid regain of strength and muscle size, however, within the first six weeks after resuming training, and can maintain strength with reduced training for up to 12 weeks. The following charts reflect the changes in strength and fiber size with detraining and retraining. 
In summary, the stoppage of resistance training results in a loss of muscular strength and muscle atrophy. However, compared to the rate of detraining following endurance exercises, the rate of detraining from resistance exercise is considerably lower. Rapid muscular adaptations occur as a result of strength training in previously trained individuals. Also, maximal dynamic strength can be maintained for up to 12 weeks with reduced training frequency. Now, looking at concurrent strength and endurance training, we see the potential for interference of adaptation. Endurance training increases mitochondrial protein, where strength training increases contractile protein. Now, this will depend on intensity, volume, and the frequency of training. Studies report that combining strength and endurance training impairs strength gains, but this will depend on the volume, the intensity, and the frequency of the training. Now, if we look at the mechanisms for the impairment of strength development, we see neural factors where there's impaired motor unit recruitment, but there's only limited evidence for this. There's also low muscle glycogen content due to the successive bouts of endurance exercise. This will lead to a reduced intensity of subsequent resistance training sessions. We can also look at overtraining, but there's no direct evidence, as well as depressed protein synthesis. Endurance training adaptations interfere with protein synthesis via the inhibition of the MTOR secondary signaling pathway. Here's a diagram looking at the intercellular signaling and inhibition of protein synthesis. In summary, individuals who engage in concurrent resistance training with high intensity endurance exercise training often report that concurrent training impairs strength gains. Several mechanisms can potentially explain why concurrent training may impair strength gains. These include neural factors, low muscle glycogen content, overtraining, and depressed protein synthesis. Concurrent resistance and endurance exercise bouts can theoretically impair protein synthesis following resistance exercise training. The science behind this prediction is illustrated in figure 13.19. That concludes the content for chapter 13. The following are study questions to help you test your knowledge. Question 1. Explain the basic principles of training, including overload, specificity, and reversibility. 2. Discuss the role that genetics play in determining VO2 max. 3. Indicate the typical changes in VO2 max with endurance training programs and the effect of the initial pre-training value on the magnitude of the increase. 4. State typical VO2 max values for various sedentary, active, and athletic populations. 5. Understand the contributions of heart rate, stroke volume, and the atrial venous O2 difference in determining VO2 max. 6. Discuss how training increases VO2 max. 7. Define preload, afterload, and contractility, and discuss the role of each in the increase in the maximal stroke volume that occurs with endurance training. 8. Describe the changes in muscle structure that are responsible for an increase in the maximal atrial venous O2 difference with endurance training. 9. List and discuss the primary changes that occur in skeletal muscle as a result of endurance training. 10. Explain how endurance training improves acid-base balance during exercise. 11. Outline the big picture changes that occur in skeletal muscle as a result of exercise training and discuss the specificity of exercise training responses. 12. List four primary signal transduction pathways in skeletal muscle. 13. List and define the function of six important secondary messengers in skeletal muscle. 14. Outline the signaling events that lead to endurance training induced muscle adaptation. 15. Discuss how changes in the central command and peripheral feedback following the endurance training program can lower the heart rate, ventilation, and catecholamine responses to submaximal exercise bout. And 16. Describe the underlying causes of the decrease in the VO2 max that occurs with the cessation of endurance training. 17. Contrast the role of the neural adaptations with hypertrophy and the increase in strength that occurs with resistance training. 18. Identify the primary changes that occur in skeletal muscle fibers in response to resistance training. 19. Outline the signaling events that lead to resistance training induced increases in muscle growth. 20. Discuss how detraining following strength training impacts muscle fiber size and strength. 21. How does retraining influence muscle fiber size and strength? 22. Explain why concurrent strength and endurance training can impair strength gains. This concludes Chapter 13, The Physiology of Training and the Effects of VO2 Max, Performance, Homeostasis, and Strength. 
Please refer to this lecture in your text if you have any additional questions or to study further. Also, feel free to email me at any time. Thanks.